Okay, uh, I think we should be live now. Um, uh, welcome to the next installment of the, uh, the Sariyama uh, Bonsai live streams. Uh, thank you all for, for, for watching and supporting. Um, it, uh, it means a lot that, uh, that so many people are kind of like enjoying these. Um, kind of like makes it all worthwhile. Uh, thank you very much, especially to, uh, uh, to those people who've donated uh, more than once, some people. Um, it's really, really uh, uh, kind of uh, deeply appreciated here. Um, we have invested some, you know, like a lot of time and money in kind of like figuring out how all this works, getting some uh, equipment and stuff. Uh, a new uh, secondhand uh, PC arrived today, um, which uh, should help us um, with streaming. I've not got onto it um, uh, just yet. Uh, but it looks like it could uh, it, it could improve things. Uh, we're figuring out how to improve bandwidth and stuff like that. Uh, but we'll you know we'll work these things out as we go along. Uh, so thank you very much for for, for people who've donated. Um, these streams are free, as I say, and um, we are doing them uh, you know during the the, the Corona lockdown initially, and um, just to kind of like um, build up uh, sort of you know just a sense of community to give people some incentive to. Uh, uh, to go out there and work on their trees. I was kind of inspired by um, by a, a wonderful uh, bunch of um, of ladies who uh, the London School of Hula and Ori, uh, who have been uh, supporting me as well. They've been uh, promoting me on social media. So thanks very much, girls. Uh, my wife, my good lady wife, is uh, she, she's a member of the, the the London School of of Dance, you know, the Hula Dance and Ori, uh, which is Tahitian dancing, uh, and they they've basically been doing. Uh, all these kind of like because nobody can meet up and do dance classes they, they were doing all of this kind of uh, zoom online uh, classes and stuff and I saw how much it meant to so uh, to my wife uh, and to everybody else to just kind of like keep that sense of community and it basically made me kind of like think well what could I do to help people uh, what can I do during this lockdown to to kind of like make people uh, get out and do more bonsai uh, and enjoy it and so kind of like uh, got into this. Uh, it was kind of like always planned to, to try and do something like this, um, but it just all happened a bit too quickly. Uh, for, but you know, such is life. Uh, so I hope everyone's out there is all okay with um, with the lockdown and, uh, uh, and always kind of like staying uh, sort of fit, both uh, physically and mentally and looking after your trees. Um, I know I'm kind of like enjoying enjoying the time to in, in the garden and, and, and working on stuff uh, and learning a lot of new stuff, um, both technologically and uh, with the trees and things like that. It's given me plenty of opportunity to, to, to think about things. Um, and I've been quite creative uh, with, with some stuff recently. Um, and it kind of like gave me opportunity to sort of think about uh, the kind of like the creative process with Bonsai and how I approach it. Uh, and so that's kind of like what I want to look at uh, tonight. Uh, it's going to be quite heavily kind of like video based. And there's going to be quite a few videos and stuff like that. So um, please do ask questions as we're going along, um, both technical and kind of about, about the process. Uh, and what we're going to do is we're going to look at a kind of like a step-by-step -step transformation of a piece of Yamadori beach material. Uh, I'm a big fan of, of um, Yamadori beach, so European beach. Um, and Japanese beach to, to a certain extent. Uh, they're a bit more difficult to grow in the, in, in the UK, um, but, uh, but beach are a very, very good tree um, to work with because they have a lot of uh, incredible natural character. Um, they're strong trees and they respond very well to, to, to bonsai techniques and you can, you can work on them and build them up quite quickly. And the material that we tend to see, uh, collective material also kind of uh, fits in very well with um, a lot of my aesthetic ideas and ideas about bonsai. Uh, and my love for, 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 for Yamadori Beach really came about when I went to Spain. Uh, I was with a uh, quite a well-known enthusiast out there, uh, Jorge Campos, and he had a phenomenal kind of collected uh, clump style beach, which you may have seen at an exhibition. I think he took it to Salio uh, one time. Uh, and I just fell in love with it. It was just phenomenal. It was just almost exactly as it had come out of the, the mountains. Uh, it was just wild, crossing trunks all over the place and branch movement, which was just outstanding. Uh, and he was, we were sort of walking through his garden and um, with him and uh, some of his, his friends. Uh, and he asked me, who was, I was fairly fresh out of Japan at the time, 
uh, what I thought about it uh, and what we should do. And I said, just, just, just do nothing. It's, you can't improve on this. It's just beautiful. Um, because it was, it was just, it had so much character. It was wild uh, and elegant at the same time. Um, and he sort of just turned to his friends and just said, see, I told you so. Because they'd all been telling him to wire everything out and do all this kind of stuff. And I just thought, no, no, you just, and he explained that to me. And then I was like, no, why would you want to do that? It's like take all of the the yama out of the yamadori. And that was kind of a, a light bulb moment for me there. Um, you know, I just kind of, I've, you know, been back to, to, to you know, to, to the West for a couple, three years maybe. Um, and was just really kind of getting to grips with, with a lot of um, collected material and how to sort of look on it. And I'd always wondered why people were collecting these trees from the mountains and then taking all of the, the, the natural character out of them um, and just putting a big green dome on the top uh, and making them look really clean and uh, and proper. And there, I mean, there is an aspect of bonsai where that is kind of like, it's, you know, a very, very valid thing, but it was just kind of seeing the raw material and the phenomenal natural character that it had and then seeing how, you know, a lot of the end results that were coming out, it's just kind of like, why? I, I couldn't understand why a lot of people were doing that. And then when I sort of came across some some of these beech, uh, many of which were collected in Spain, uh, like uh, some of the ones that I've got here um, have been, uh, and just the kind of the the natural uh, movement within the branches um, was just, uh, you know, you just, like you couldn't improve on that. You'd putting wire on it would have just just destroyed it. Uh, and that kind of chimed, that you know, that sort of uh, struck a chord with me. And so I, you know, uh, have endeavoured to, to kind of like work with, with beach um, where possible and also to try and uh, keep the, the yama, which means mountain, uh, in Yamadori wherever possible uh, and not do like ridiculous things and, and just kind of, um, you know, wire every branch out and make it all look, uh, you know, pretty and perfect. Uh, but that's my aesthetic. Um, Kind of uh, taste, you know. That's what I, I'm, I'm kind of like looking to explore within bonsai. Um, and so, you know, other people doing other things, that's fine. You know, it, it, it's a, bonsai is a, is, a, is a broad church. Uh, there's lots of murders in it, and uh, it's uh, you know, there's, there's lots of different aesthetic ideas and things like that. So, you know, it's just you, you just have to find which whichever one it works for you. Uh, and you know, that's 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 kind of like. When I saw those trees, that's what worked for me. Uh, but anyway, we're kind of like getting away from it. So, um, so yes, yeah, so I'm always looking to try and keep that natural character uh, within the trees, and always looking to try and find it uh, and, and bring it out to, to the best of my abilities. And I also like a challenge, uh, kind of like the on Instagram and stuff like that. I've got uh, you know the hashtag Leave No Tree Behind. Uh, we're trying to take just you know kind of like piece of material that people laugh at, um, and just wouldn't know what to do with them uh, and try and find creative solutions. So the tree that we're going to look at today is one of those. Uh, it was, it's, it's when you look at it originally, it's, it's kind of like a bit, a bit strange. And when I was buying it, the guy who was selling it to me was like, you sure? I was like, yes, uh, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm very sure. Um, and it was, uh, as a result, it was um, a very reasonable price. Uh, and so, you know, working on trees like this, um, you've got to kind of like uh, get to know them a little bit um, and have a little bit of sort of uh, mental flexibility as, when you when you um, sort of come to work with them. And so not trying to kind of like inflict an idea or, you know, uh, push uh, an, an image on it on it too much. And as we sort of go through the, the, the sort of the styling of this tree, you'll see that there is uh, a certain amount of kind of like organic. Bluetooth is disconnected. Oh, well. That's nice of you. Sorry, look. Bluetooth. It... I wasn't supposed to happen. Apparently, Bluetooth has been disconnected. Um, uh, so, what was I saying? Yeah, uh, the uh, kind of like the organic nature of, of, of the, the styling process, um, whereby you kind of wait and see what the tree provides in terms of kind of like the roots or you know the possibilities of planting and things like this. Um, in particular, with with, with this. Um, uh, transformation. So I had an idea in my mind where I wanted to go, um, but it wasn't a fixed one. Okay, I was prepared to, to kind of like 
work with the tree uh, and just see where see where we went along. And so as we, as you're kind of like watching through these videos, um, keep uh, one eye on the the techniques that are being used because um, there's a few that you may not have seen um, or, or just slightly different ways of doing things. But also kind of just have a, um, a kind of a just 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 look at how the the possibilities kind of arise and how I kind of just like sort of work with them. Uh, the videos are kind of like broken down into into sort of smaller sections and stuff like that. So there'll be we'll just have a bit of a chat about what's what's happened uh, in those in the, in those sections. So if you've got questions or anything, just uh, you know type them up and we'll get on with them. Okay. So the first one is looking at uh, kind of like just uh, possibilities and then um, starting to look at the roots. Okay. So we're going to have a look at Repot on this beach. Uh, it's the Yamadori Beach. Uh, it's a bit of a strange, uh, very vertical trunk, uh, which comes up to this deadwood section there and splits off up along this main line here. Some lower branching, uh, nothing to speak of though. Lots and lots of uh, adventitious buds and shoots all coming up along the trunk here. I've had this for, uh, for a year, I was collected for a year before that. Uh, so it's, it's in very, very good health. Uh, the buds are just really swelling now we're getting to the limit of where we can repot them uh, the old leaves on there you touch them they fall off which is a good sign to be uh, to be repotting um not 100 percent certain what we're going to do with this um with it being sort of lied down like this and then that straight trunk all the way up um so just have a play around with some of the angles and, and see what could be done all right so just have a look at some of the different angles that we could look at. Utilize the trunk line, perhaps up into here. Cut off or air layer all of that top section. That's one option. Alternatively, we could perhaps look at taking what was a very vertical trunk, taking it off of the vertical, not being afraid to use that straight line. And uh, uh, Go with maybe like a slanting style, using that as a as a branch, uh, building the apex up in there. That's one possibility. Uh, don't think it works quite so well that way because of the straightness. Um, but something like that is a, is a definite option. There's movement if we tweak it round. Although then the base then sort of comes towards us. So that's perhaps not so great. Um, but there is some sort of slight movement in there. Um, so. It all just really sort of depends on what the roots give us um, as to what we can sort of do with it. So we'll open it up, have a look and see where it takes us. Right, so we're gonna start uh, to, to gently break down the, the root ball. Uh, what we're gonna use uh, very carefully, not too aggressively, is a three pronged uh, root hook. Uh, it's a very aggressive tool, uh, particularly if the, the points are sharp, uh, it can just tear into and damage roots. So it's, uh, a tool which must be used with great caution. Uh, the other thing that we'll be using is a bamboo chopstick. Again, fairly blunt ended. Uh, and then uh, a bent tipped, it shouldn't be bent, it should be straight. Uh, sort of aluminium chopstick as well. Uh, that potentially pairs of tweezers. Okay, so we'll get on with that. Okay, so as I said, very aggressive tool. And so we just use it very carefully on the outer edges. Okay, if you're having to put a lot of effort in to, to remove the soil, then <clears throat> it is going to be tearing roots and uh, damaging things. We don't want to be doing that. The objective is to try and get rid of as much of the, the soil but keep as many of the roots. Okay. Uh, great care must be taken around the, like the, the labari, the base of the trunk, the roots, etc., with uh, anything, with any metal tools, uh, so, so as not to damage them. Once we get close to that, then we'll be switching to the bamboo. <clears throat> so, what I'm smelling for is a musky smell. Um, of mycorrhiza. On beach, all trees are dependent on their relationship with mycorrhiza, a beneficial fungus which uh, is fed by the roots of the tree uh, and acts as a 
kind of a fine root network for the for the tree, uh, absorbing, um, metabolizing um, nutrients uh, and moisture uh, for easy absorption for the tree. Um, uh, but beech with beech, it's very very important, uh, and it has a distinct kind of like musty smell, uh, and so it's important to to, to ensure that. Um, that's maintained and so what we would never want to do is root wash um, a beach uh, and wash all of that out. Uh, we can kind of get rid of a lot of the, the soil and the dust uh, using an air compressor but we never want to be just washing everything off and getting rid of all of that beneficial mycorrhiza. Uh, it is really one thing that I found uh, it's really uh, the development of that mycorrhiza um, it is really helped by having organic material within the soil uh, so this is obviously a Yamadori tree um, and the soil is uh, kind of uh, pumice and kind of like composty type based. Okay, uh, And we do smell, uh, there's, there's evidence of mycorrhiza in there and so the soil mixture that we're going to use for this um, will have a certain amount of, very small amount of kind of like organic material in there um, in order to, to, to kind of give the, the mycorrhiza a place to uh, to thrive and to flourish because it, it finds it very difficult to do that in say pure pumice alone anything that's like just purely inorganic so s small sharp strokes uh, is, is what we need not putting too much aggression into it just small and sharp strokes. If you're tearing away, you know, big chunks of root, stop. Okay, and always go from the center outwards, center outwards, center outwards. Okay. Okay, so we've broken down the root ball just generally all over. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to go in with our chopstick and keep at it. Okay, what we'll be very careful of is any roots that are potentially coming out from the, from the trunk underneath here. I've just spotted one coming from the trunk here. As it's been laying down, this point has been touching the soil uh, and is obviously rooted. Okay, so we should just go be careful of, of roots like that. If there's a lot of kind of fibrous roots coming off of it, then we might need to keep it. If there aren't, then we could probably just look at getting rid of it, depending on our angles. So this motion is just stabbing in and out, in and out, in and out. I'm not pulling or tearing, it's just in and out, in and out. And what that does is breaking up the soil and allowing a lot of these big particles of pumice and stuff to fall out. Okay. going to try and keep as much of this root as I possibly can. Okay. Now there's a few weeds that are stuck in the surface uh, and some of those weed roots will be growing into the soil. Uh, and so it's, it's important that you be able to differentiate the, uh, between the beech roots and uh, the weed roots. The weed roots tend to be uh, white, they're very sort of fibrous. Um, the beet roots will be slightly darker colour, brownie colour. Okay, I'm starting to see quite a big root that comes across here, finishes there. There are some side roots off of it, so that there are options for reducing the. Uh, the length of that root if needs be. Okay, so there's a lot of roots of weeds all tucked in and around underneath the, the roots of the tree here. It's a pain. So again, stabbing action. Okay, so just noticing 
starting to notice some of these roots here are beginning to dry out a little bit. Okay. Ideally, repotting should be done inside or in a sheltered area where the sun and the wind can't get on it. It's one of the reasons for putting the sheet up um, and also to give us a nice backdrop. But if we are starting to notice those roots drying out, then we'll get the sprayer on it uh, and get them moistened up. Oh yeah. See that big long tap root of the weed? Thank God that's out. Okay, ideally, you should never let weeds grow in your trees. Okay. Uh, but particularly with uh, some of the Yamadori trees, when they get collected, uh, all of the weeds that are around um, the tree get collected along with it, so that it kind of keeps that root ball uh, nice and solid uh, during the collection process. Uh, and so quite often there are a lot of those kind of like um, native weeds that are still in and around the root base. And they've done a job in terms of keeping the, the, the integrity of that initial collected root ball. Um, but then in sort of captive cultivation, what will happen is they'll end up sort of uh, potentially uh, dominating within the pot, uh, choking the roots of the, of the, of the tree uh, and becoming a nuisance. And so it should be removed. Any uh, weeds that develop subsequent from that as well, you know, should be should be removed as and when possible. Okay, so the root ball's nice and wet. I'm gonna wet it again, and then we're gonna get the compressor on it to get rid of a lot more of this, uh, the, the dirt and stuff in and around. Okay, so I've got my air gun, uh, which we're gonna use carefully to, uh, to get rid of a lot of the, uh, the soil around and the mud around on the root ball. Okay, this block of soil that was underneath here when it was, uh, it was all laying down has now sort of separated itself and come away. Uh, those roots that we had uh, kind of growing from that point where the trunk started moving back upwards, there's hardly anything on them uh, and so we can get rid of those. We don't need to to worry about those, they're not really contributing anything. Uh, some trees will ground layer themselves very, very easily, um, and those roots, which are kind of like the closest to the foliage, will often become very, very dominant. Uh, but in this case, there's hardly any sort of fibrous roots growing off of those. Those have only developed in, you know, since it's been put into captivity, I would say, uh, and so we can get rid of those without worrying too much. Okay, so that's given us a much better option for something sort of windswept-ish like we were looking at earlier because the now all of that has been exposed. Okay, if we want to go with that style, which I think is the direction we want to be going in, we just need to start focusing on this top end, this chunk of the roots here, because it's nice and tight around everywhere else. This is just the bit that's kind of like sticking out. Okay, so we'll have a look at how we can get rid of that. Okay, so this is that big lump that we were talking about. Okay, the rest of the root ball. Yeah, it's fairly compact. Okay, we don't need to do any major surgery except on this area here. Okay, so this is this is the root that's really kind of the longest one. So it just works from the soil around that. Okay, we have a decent amount, but not the entire tree, tree supply of roots on, on this one. So there's a decent chunk of roots there, but it's really difficult to see in there. But that root there is coming from, from in here. And then there's one similar place. So there's one a similar place around the other side. Okay, so we have one there and one there. So we can come in and cut back to that. And then those two roots will then sort of take over. Okay. Okay, so now with it out, uh, we've got some, uh, some possibilities and some options. Um, and so what I am looking at very much like so is that windswept type feel to it, movement up and across, 
and then we just have to look at what we do with these branches. That one will probably have to come off because of its verticality. This one could be bent potentially down and out around, around the back there. So I think that's going to be the most interesting use of this very straight line uh, and the root system. Uh, so we're just going to have to look at some of these surface roots in here now. Uh, but that's the, 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 the options that we've got. Uh, it could go onto a rock, um, but the rock would have to be fairly small. Uh, it couldn't be too big a rock um, because of the thinness of the trunk. Okay, so there's not a whole lot of kind of like visual weight um, within that trunk. Okay, um, and it's quite slender, delicate movement that we've got in here, ever so slight, just kind of like movements around. And so if we have, if we put it on a rock, um, the character balance between the two might, it would be very difficult to, to, to achieve. And so if we had a, a rock that was too characterful, then the tree would lose out to it. Okay, so I'll have a look at the rocks that we've got, maybe match up a couple, but I'm thinking it's going to go into a pot at the moment. Okay, so looking at the root system here, we have this one strong root, which is kind of like, uh, which is coming from the trunk. Okay, there is a little few sort of side roots that have come off of it. In there but nothing to speak of um, but we have this one more uh, uh, sort of vigorous youthful shoot root which is coming from the side very close, sort of close to the base now what we want to try and do is either get that bent down which this big thick one isn't going to do but this youthful one is so we can get into a nice tight compact root ball okay like that um, and so what we're going to look at doing is cutting that one back as hard as we can not all the way back to the trunk, but just enough so that we can then really sort of get that compact root ball in there. We might end up actually having to cut that one off there. Sorry, I didn't record me cutting it off. Uh, but there wasn't a whole lot of root on that, so we did, we're not losing out too much. Okay, so we've made, we shortened that one in there. Okay. And now we can definitely get that root ball a lot more compact into a smaller, shallower pot or onto a rock if we want it to be. Okay, so uh, I know it's a little bit kind of like uh, boring watching somebody uh, removing soil, um, but one of the things that is very difficult for uh, a lot of people to, like from the beginning bonsai, uh, to kind of get a real gris, uh, a grasp on is kind of like the, the repotting techniques and just kind of like how aggressive you should be or shouldn't be. Um, you know, some of the tools that we have, like the, the three-pronged uh, bear claw, are very aggressive tools. And if you go in and use them very aggressively, pull, pull, then uh, you're just going to cause incredible amounts of damage. Uh, and so uh, it's kind of like one of those things you've got to learn from either seeing it in, in, in real life, seeing somebody who doing it properly, or, or you know, like from a video where you can get a kind of um, uh, a good feel for the speed that's been, that's been doing it, and also the lack of kind of like pulling and pressure. It's just that kind of like in and out movement. Um, so that's one of the reasons why I kind of like wanted to, to, to highlight that. Um, but really, uh, in terms of kind of like the the, the design of the tree uh, and things like that, the um, you know the important thing with kind of like working with the the collective trees on that first repot. Uh, is really to sort of figure out where the roots are uh, and what opportunities they give you, and so particularly kind of like being concerned about the um, the the roots that were kind of like close to the to to, to, to where the trunk sort of turned up. You know, if there were a lot of um, uh, roots coming off of that, then then that would have been kind of like a real uh, would have needed to. to, to definitely keep that as part of the design and that would have needed to change things um, dramatically but because of the, that wasn't there uh, and because beech were quite a strong rooting species anyway uh, we were able to kind of like get rid of those and uh, then give ourselves another you know uh, six seven uh, centimeters of trunk um, which was previously kind of like lying on the surface of the soil uh, and so really kind of getting to, to, to understand where those roots are uh, is, is essential for, for pretty much all kind of like um, Yamadori sort of star repots. Um, one of the other things I wanted, wanted to just sort of uh, clarify is that, you know, like, yes, we're getting rid of a lot of the soil, but we want to try and keep as much of it kind of like as, you know, there as possible. Uh, a lot of it was was lost, um, but there's still plenty of it kind of like in contact. And so you saw me smelling the, the, the roots. 
and to, to kind of like check for the, the, the presence of mycorrhiza. You know, if we went in there and washed off all of the, the soil, then all of that gets disappeared, uh, it, you know, it gets washed away. Uh, and so the mycorrhiza isn't there to, to recolonize in the in its new uh, environment, whatever that might be. Uh, and so it's it's kind of important to try and try and try and maintain some of that uh, wherever possible. Uh, and so kind of by not washing it off, uh, it, it it definitely sort of keeps them in there. Uh, another aspect about kind of um, the the beach in particular, uh, this applies to Japanese and European. Uh, is that they're very kind of like apically dominant species in terms of both buds and roots. Uh, and so they are a species that you kind of do want to repot fairly frequently, um, even when they're, they're, you know, they're, they're, they're in captivity and they've been tamed because uh, we don't want to let any kind of uh, roots become sort of very strong and dominant. Uh, and this is what you do tend to see um, with, with, with beach. You know, you can get one or two roots which really sort of start to overpower everything else. And then one or two branches on the top, which just you know, then do the same. Uh, and so going in and sort of cutting back those those strong, heavy roots back to two side roots, uh, in the same way that we would do it with a branch. So we, you know, big, strong, heavy branch. We look for side lateral branches that we can cut back to uh, in order to develop that taper. Uh, and such so like and build up ramification. We do exactly the same with roots. And for some species, it's really, really important. Uh, and beech are kind of like one of those because of their, their kind of like natural um, growth tendencies. So now we've got a, a good uh, idea of, of what we can do with with all the roots and such like. Um, now it's kind of like to, to look at uh, what possibilities there are of planting. And at that point, I was pretty convinced I was going to put it into a pot. Uh, I think I said it in the video there. Um, I wasn't thinking about anything else because I've, I've I've kind of done all the, the the crazy things and stuff, and it was just kind of like okay, let's try and because it's cause because the trunk was so thin. Um, I think I made the point there, like, trying to add more to it, 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 uh, the battle between uh, you know like for a thin trunk uh, and other things. It's, it's, it's very difficult to to try and really kind of like achieve that balance, um, you, which is why you know like literati trees, you, you often see them in very simple, very shallow pots because you the the, the balance between the two. Uh, can only be achieved by trying to keep it as simple as possible and that was kind of like where my, my mind was to begin with so I went out into the garden however had a look around okay okay so we've got a rock uh, possible um, this is one of those uh, Italian lava rocks uh, there's a bit of a natural uh, depression in there okay and there's already some, been some holes drilled in there previously for um, uh, for, for tying down and such like. Um, but what makes this one so possible and interesting is the fact that kind of like at this angle the roots and the tree kind of sit there as though it was naturally on that. Okay? Uh, there's a big pocket uh, for, um, for soil to get in underneath where we saw uh, and there's plenty of area down here, okay. Uh, but what I think would be interesting would be to plant this on the rock, okay, and then into uh, into a pot, okay, so that we can kind of orientate the rock at this angle, uh, and also give the tree a little bit of extra space to grow into, okay. So what we'll do is we'll think about uh, a pot choice for this. Okay, so here's uh, here's one possible option. Um, this is a antique-ish, so probably about 50 to 60, maybe a bit older, uh, Chinese pot. Um, but don't let that put you off. Uh, it's really, really nice. It's got great uh, soil characteristics um, uh, and it's very, very well made. Um, but it just feels like the, the, um, the, bio, the nails on it, on the, the Tyco drum, uh, basically when you have that, um, We've got this one point here, which defines the front of the tr uh, of the pot, uh, and so that's going to be um, a little bit more kind of like difficult for um, for using with like a, an organic type of tree like this, where maybe there isn't just one defined perfect front. Okay, so at the moment you can see it's just um, strapped on there with uh, with cable tie, uh, and then kind of like uh, supported just so we get an idea of. of roughly kind of work, the, the, the feeling that's going to be given. 
Okay, so although that's nice uh, and it fits the rock in very nicely on both sides. Okay, we are not going to use this one because of that definite front. Next up is this uh, Ian Bailey pot. Okay, so another round, this time with a slightly bigger lip. Okay, uh, which is very nice. Uh, but again, the, the orientation of the feet. Okay, so we have a gap in between the feet here and around there. Mean that, again, we're gonna have to kind of like commit to, to one obvious front. Okay, so perhaps it's definitely better than the last one because we can kind of get away with that foot uh, not being exactly square on at the front. A lot easier than we can with the nails. Um, but I think we're going to keep looking. Okay, so here's another option. Uh, this is a Nakawatari uh, Chinese pot. Okay, so about 150, 250 years old. Uh, it's a lovely patina to it. Nice subdued kind of character and colour. Uh, different shape this time, oval. Okay, but again, that same kind of issue of um, definite fronts is, a, is, is, is there uh, and also feels just ever so slightly uh, too small for the balance of the composition. Okay, what we're definitely looking at is the accentuation of, you know, this space in here. Okay. Uh, and this whole area there just feels very, very heavy and the pot doesn't do enough to balance it. Okay, so last up we have this wood-fired round uh, from my favourite French pot, it's Nendothai. Okay, I'm liking the, the, the textures uh, and the colours. Uh, going up into you know into the rock, uh, the similarity between those colours and the winter foliage colours of the beach are very nice. Okay, and that space that we've got in here, the volume and the kind of the balance between the upward outward curving aspect of the pot as opposed to the previous uh, more confined space of the oval adds to a more expansive feel and so although the pot is small the space which it creates or in kind of induces in the in the viewer's mind is actually much larger and so that balance when we look at it from a distance and so that balance when we view it from a distance it feels a little better and the feminine shape i think accentuates it a lot more so we're going to go with this one for, i think so first of all what we're going to do we're going to look at fixing the tree to the rock and then the rock to the pot Okay, so you can see how um, some very small details within the pots um, can actually uh, make a huge difference to, to certain trees. Um, now, one of the, another thing that I feel very kind of like strongly about personally is um, the front uh, and having sort of these um, very definite fronts of trees. Um, it's, it's something which, uh, we're not going to go into it too much here, but there will be another stream on it, I'm sure, um, with certain, certain other trees. Um, but in my opinion, you don't just look at the bonsai from, from, from one uh, distinct front. Uh, and some of those pots and some of the things that, um, you know, it would have been uh, limited. It would have very much limited the, the possibilities going forward. Uh, and so, um, obviously went for something which um, aesthetically was, was, was very well balanced, but also gave us that kind of like organic feel uh, and the ability to, 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 to kind of have a lot of play, you know, with where the front could possibly be. Uh, and so, so that, was a, that was quite an important um, uh, uh, sort of 
factor in, in, in the plot decision. Another point I'd like to make there is you notice that uh, the, the tree still had as many leaves on it as possible. Uh, they were falling off as we were kind of like working on. That was a deliberate and conscious um, uh, thing to, to kind of like try and at least help me to imagine what the tree might be like with a little bit more bulk on top. You know, as you know, with some leaves on it, how it might look uh, within, you know, like in autumn uh, uh, and a kind of like a winter image. So these those leaves were were sort of deliberately left on them. Uh, the ones on the tree behind here are just because I've been lazy and not taking them off. Okay, <coughs> so we, we, we the the plan is now starting to sort of come together. Um, it's it's going pretty much kind of like how I first imagined it to go to. Uh, I did kind of want to just, just put it into a pot by itself, but see then we found a rock which which, uh, which worked really well. Uh, so now we'll kind of like look at how to, to kind of like uh, prepare the rock um, and, the, and, and the pot together uh, and, and prepare the, the rock for being planted. A question. Okay, so first up we're gonna make the, the keto. Uh, so the the mud that uh, it's going to stick, the tree's going to stick to, uh, and grow into, uh, and we start off with a bag of Keto soil. Uh, this is available from all good bonsai retailers. Uh, this brand is uh, perhaps a little bit more pricey than others, but this is very, very good quality stuff. Uh, it can be used almost straight from the bag. Okay, um, it's imported by Zach's Bonsai, uh, and. Uh, I've been using it for a couple of years now and it's phenomenal. Okay, so that's just the keto by itself. Okay, and to that we are going to add uh, some very small particle soil. All right, so we're gonna add some small particle soil. Okay, this is the smallest uh, Akadama pumice lava that mix that we've got. Okay. And then I'm going to add some very, very small particle uh, Akadama. So this is basically the stuff that comes out of the bottom when you're sieving through the, to get all the different grades of Akadama when you're repotting. Keep this stuff. Uh, there's a bit of dust in there, but that's okay for, for rock plantings. Okay. Okay, and then the final. Okay, and then the final thing is unchopped, rough cut sphagnum moss. Okay, now we use this to help hold the uh, to hold moisture in there, and also the reason why we want to leave it kind of uncut is it helps structurally, like with the binding everything together. Okay, now the ra ratio of these different components changes depending on um, the kind of the orientation of or you know what you're doing with the keto so like a, a much more vertical um kind of composition i would perhaps have a little bit more sphagnum moss in there to give it a lot more sort of structural integrity uh something which is just kind of like horizontal then perhaps be a little bit less sphagnum moss um if it's going to be planted entirely in uh this sort of keto mixture then i would try add a little bit more akadama uh, and, and, and the soil, okay. So that ratio, it, it depends on so many different things. Uh, An experience will teach you kind of like what's the best uh, thing to do. But if you just understand the kind of like the, the, um, the properties of each of those um, components and what they do, then It'll kind of help you to make the right decisions as to what, uh, what what we want to use. Okay, so I'm going to want to put a little bit more soil in there. I feel. Okay. Just add a little bit more in there. A little bit more of my fine Akadama dust. Okay, give that a really good mix up. Mix it up like you're making a cake. Okay. And 
one of the interesting things about uh, translating articles of from Kimbon to uh, to English is the uh, the description that they use when talking about keto and its consistency um, is that it should be the the consistency or you know like when you when you squeeze it it should feel like squeezing your earlobe. Uh, I don't know who came up with that description for it, um, and everyone's earlobes are different, I suppose, but there you go, that's the Japanese for you. Okay, but once it's kind of like got a nice sort of consistency, it's not too, it doesn't break up too much when you squish it. Okay, it's not going to stay too hard. Okay, that's what we want. Okay, so you can make it in, into, into balls, smaller balls. Uh, which may be a little bit easier when you're applying it. Okay, but again, different situations, different, uh, require different um, techniques. Okay, so this rock already had uh, a piece of wire that goes across uh, there. Uh, so we can use that to uh, to create some, some tie down wires. Okay, so we'll put a couple around there. Uh, but we'll, what we'll also do is use um, cable ties as well. There are many different ways that we can uh, try and fix um, wires into a rock for um, for tying a tree down to. Um, so what we'll do with at the bottom is we'll look at because we're going to need to fix this into. Um, into the pot. So we'll just have a think about how that's going to happen. Okay. So I'd just like to point out at the moment the, the tree is inside uh, in the shade in the cool uh, so the roots aren't going to be um, kind of getting exposed and drying out. So we're going to be looking at something kind of like that type of orientation. Okay so what we'll need to think about is the rock wants to fall backwards there so perhaps look at some type of, um, okay, so that's helping with the, with the angle that we want, but then we're also gonna to want to look at maybe sort of tying it down uh, in a different way, okay? So we need to investigate where the holes in the pot are. Okay, but there is a wire hole just there underneath the rock. You see it there? Uh, and then also we have the two drainage holes here that we could look at some type of, uh, sort of tie down wire or brace. Okay, so we're going to figure out a way of doing that. So a more elegant solution uh, than having that chopstick sticking out the back will be to have, uh, difficult to see, uh, uh, put another rock in there that will just be visible outside of the, uh, the soil surface. Okay. Oh, for fuck's sake. Sort of surface. Uh, but what wants to happen is uh, the rock wants to fall backwards. Um, so what we're going to need to look at doing is look at pulling it down by fixing a wire into the rock where my finger is there and pulling it directly down to that hole. Okay. And also potentially doing another one here down to that central hole there. Okay, so what I've got is some copper wire, bend it over in two, like this. So what I'll do is then make that as compact as possible, crush that in, okay, and then that's going to go into the hole like this, okay, fits quite nicely in there, okay. Now what we need is a little bit of cement and some no nonsense super glue. Okay, so this is some postcrete. Okay. And we just put in some of that powder in there. Okay, fill that hole up. Okay, not too much. 
just a little bit there. We don't want the rock, the little pebbles and rocks, if we can help it. Okay, take our super glue, and this is where you've got to be very careful. Gloves, etc. Don't sniff it, don't drink it, etc., etc. Unless you're an idiot. Okay, and then we just got to try and pour it in so that it gets into that hole and the cement absorbs it. Okay. Okay, so while that was drying, what we're gonna do is we're just gonna look at how we can fix one in there. There isn't a natural, obvious um, indentation. Uh, and so what we'll do, using a nice masonry bit, small enough, we'll just drill a small little hole in here. Just deep enough to get the wire in. And then we do the same thing. Okay, put the wire in the hole. Get the cement in there. Yes, mate. Bit of glue. Get that poke down. Cap that off, so to speak. Okay, now we don't have to worry about how extracted this is because this is going to be under the soil, but if it was going to be in a position where uh, you might view it, you've got to be a lot more careful. Okay. Now we'll give that 30 seconds to dry and that'll be strong enough to lift up. Okay, that was the one we did earlier. Same thing there, but within 30 seconds of doing it, that's strong enough to lift it up. Okay, given an hour, that's gonna cure, that's gonna set. All of that glue is gonna have been soaked up into all of the cement uh, and into the um, surrounding uh, rock as well, okay? There's no hard and fast rules about how to fix the wires in or the, the, the rocks in a pot. You've just got to try and figure it out as you go along. Uh, and each situation is different. Okay. But that's sitting there. Still gives us a little bit of play if we want to change, change the angle. Particularly once we get some soil in there, that will change things as well. Okay. But as we were sort of saying about the pot choice, that not having a, 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 a definite front um, is, is a great kind of like enabler of um, changing things as, as, as we go. Okay, but we're roughly where we wanted with that, that angle, we can still change it around if we want. Okay, we've got a bit of play one way or the other. Uh, so now it's time to start fixing the, the tree to the rock. Okay, so what we, how we're going to start that off with is covering all of this uh, hollow in here. All of the hollow in there, getting as much keto in and on that as we possibly can so that the, the tree is going to grow its roots. 
Okay, so uh, each time you do like a rock planting or, or, or anything like that, every sort of situation is going to be the same. So uh, if you're planting directly on a rock, then obviously there's different techniques that you'd be using to kind of like create pockets in which to plant um, plant trees and things like that. So using the rock uh, and the pot um, combination, um, obviously even then there's there's, there's different um, situations you might need. Uh, on a couple of other posts or videos or something, they, there's um, some of the creations that I made with those rocks I actually sort of cemented them to a tile um, uh, in order to kind of like have a, have a, a, a way to, to kind of like fix them. Uh, or they were actually kind of like cemented um, or you know epoxy glued to the pot themselves. Um, so this, each sort of different situation um, has different sort of requirements. Um, uh, and so like with this one, what I was looking for as well was that little bit of play. So I didn't want it to be entirely fixed. And so I just wanted to, to be maybe be able to change the angle, stand it up a little bit, lay it down a little bit more and things like that, but still have the, the solidity in there. Um, as I probably mentioned in the video there, like once the soil gets into the into the pot and the trees sort of like sat on it and everything, then it, it pretty much becomes kind of like fixed. And I was kind of like prepared to glue that other rock or you know, like epoxy, uh, use some epo epoxy putty on that on the on the support rock around the back there if it was needed. But as it happened, like all of the, the, the forces kind of like balanced themselves out. Um I was gonna say, oh, the, uh, the the cement and the and the glue thing uh, that works very well with the with the, the, the sort of the, the volcanic rock um, with something which is a little bit more kind of like granite, um, like the Ibigawa rocks, and something which is really really hard and tough. Um, it is a little bit more difficult, uh, and it's almost impossible to kind of like just sort of stick it to a, sh a sheer face, like where there's no kind of like crevices or anything. And so with those sort of more solid types of rocks, what you would definitely be looking at doing is is drilling a hole to to, to put it in. Or um, finding like a natural crevice, like the the first wire that we put in there, there was like a natural hole that we that we found to put in, uh, and so you know, sort of doing it that way. Uh, another technique would be to use epoxy putty, which I'm sure you, uh, it's fine, but like you can find that out somewhere else or in other videos and stuff like that. But yeah, that that, that was the one we used there. Okay, so. As you can see, we're still kind of like, we're giving ourselves this 5%, 10% um, areas of kind of like uh, changing possibilities as the things kind of like progress on. Uh, and so it's, we're slowly kind of like weaving our way, getting getting towards a, towards a, a kind of like a finished image. Okay, uh, and so now is the time to kind of like really start to, to formalize uh, uh, some of those ideas and actually get the thing onto, uh, onto the rock. So uh, here we go. I will answer some of the, the, the more relevant questions like right towards the end. So you really need to squish it into all of the gaps. Get as much of it in there as you possibly can. Right, so the soil is going to come up to, to about here anyway. Okay. Just want to make sure we've got all the cato in that pocket. Okay. okay, we're also going to want the roots to come down, grow around this side and into the soil underneath there. So we've got to make sure we've got a good amount of keto there. Now what we could do is build it up on that side once we get some soil in. So the roots have been wrapped in this uh, wet towel for the, the, the whole time it's been sort of exposed and we've been working on the, the rock and everything so it's all been kept moist okay that comes the difficult bit get the wires out of the way try and see how it Perfect, right. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to memorize this position, okay, and then look and see where I need to put a bit of extra keto on the rock. 
terms of where the root ball is going to go. Okay, so we need to put a bit up around here, a bit up in around this area, a little bit further down there, and then we're good to go. Now, if this was a, a, a bigger tree, um, or if the centre of gravity, or you know, the move, movement was going outside of the pot, uh, then what I'd definitely be doing is uh, fixing the, the pot to the um, to the actual uh, the pot. It's, you know, fixing the rock to the pot itself. So gluing it in there with some epoxy, uh, or sticking it to a tile or something else. Um, but really, what's going to happen? With the, the weight of the tree coming back across itself, that's going to help to balance it. It's not going to fall that way anymore. It's, if anything, it's going to want to fall this way. And so the rock's not going to come too far forward. Um, so the, the, the weight of the rock, the physical weight of the rock, and the physical weight of the tree will kind of cancel each, 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 each other out. And so that needing to go in there and actually kind of like cement the, the rock to the, to the pot isn't necessary in this case. Um, which helps because I don't want to damage the pot. I might want to use it for something else in the future. Okay, one of the best inventions in the world, plastic cable ties. One of my favourite things ever. Okay, so we'll just connect two together. Okay, very, very useful if you only have one pair of hats. I will guarantee you that. Okay, so. I'm going to do is cut off some roots that are now going to be sort of sticking up and out. Okay, the worst angle for me, but hey. Okay, so I've got this one root that's kind of like sticking out, wanting to go down that way. What I could do to make it really interesting is to separate that out and actually train that to go in that crack and down there, which is what we're going to do actually because that's going to look absolutely great as it grows and thickens. I don't know if you can see that properly. Okay, we've got this big strong root. We're going to tra train that all the way down the back there. So in order to do that, what we need to do is get as much keto in that gap as we possibly can. We need a chopstick. Okay, so we're going to fill that gap with, with keto. Push it in there as much as we possibly can. And then we just train, put some kettle on the back there, just to give it a path down. So a lot of these, uh, you know, the rock plants and stuff, it is, I will say just make it up as you go along, but it's the, as you're putting things together, different opportunities um, show themselves. Okay, so I couldn't really plan for that right from the start, um, but the way in which the roots were growing and that root there gave us that possibility to, to do so. So, let's try and separate that individual root system as much as we possibly can. Okay, so we've got all of those roots there by itself. in that rock as much as we possibly can. Okay. Without obviously damaging the roof. Okay, so we're roughly kind of where we want to be. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this move away from those wires. Get the strap on. Tighten it up. It's sitting on there quite nicely, so I'm not needing to put a lot of pressure on. Okay, right, so we've got this one stub here, which was left deliberately. Okay. So we'll attach one of the wires to that, and that'll tie it, pull it back 
tremendously. It doesn't matter if it scars on here. That's where we want to be. It's too far across towards the front there. I was too worried about that route. So I look at it from the side. Okay, that's much more central now. So these are the routes here that we're going to want to grow down this side. Okay, so the roots off of here. We're going to want to come down and underneath there. Okay, we'll put some kettle on that later. So we don't want to be tightened so much that we're actually kind of cutting through roots uh, and damaging anything. So it is only on there quite loosely. Okay. That whole thing can then come off right at the base. We don't need that. Now it's sticking out. Off proud from the from the main line. Makes it tighter to the. Makes it much tighter to the uh, to the trunk. Okay. Right. So we've got to reposition this root in there. Okay. Okay. We have the fine roots. Gonna go down. We're literally just gonna push them into that keto and then down into the pot. Okay, these are still moist, but we don't want to dry out. Okay, and then we get some keto on top of that, just push it in, squish it as tight as we possibly can. whole thing is just covered in that. Now some of them will die, um, but not all of them. Uh, that is for certain. Uh, but the ones that survive will then thrive uh, and send out secondary roots, tertiary roots improve so not worried about that at all okay so we've got one floating route here so what we'll do is we'll use this wire to go over the top let's get a bit of protection okay it's a bit of rubber hose just place that over the top okay so we'll push that route down just got to be careful not to break it, obviously. Okay. And then that goes over the top there. Tie to one of those ends of the wire down here. And that's going to keep everything tight and close. The rock there. Now, I want to make sure we can see as much of the rock on the front as we possibly can. 
Okay, so push some of that keto back in. Exposing a bit more of the rock, and then really squish those rocks, uh, the, the those roots, into the keto that we had underneath. Okay, and on top of that, we're going to add another layer of keto. Okay, not worried about it getting down into the pot here. Okay, now, no matter what you do, the roots are always going to kind of try and come up. And so we're going to have to find a way to, to squeeze, squish that up. Try and get as much of the keto out of the, the pot as we possibly can. Okay, this area here where we want those bits to be going around. Okay, so just got to think about how we can get that flattened in there. The tree's pretty solid on there with all the bits that have been tied down. So I'm going to re release the, this cable tie here and see how it responds. If it moves, feels like it's going to move then. We can. Yeah, so that's still a little bit weak there. Right, what we're going to do is going to put a cable tie around here and that will help to squish those roots in there and keep those nice and tight there. The good thing about these being wide, they cover quite a large kind of expansive area and they don't tend to kind of cut through like a cheese wire. So in that aspect it's much better than using a wire. Pull too hard, that's to cut through the rock. Okay, so that's as tight as we can go there. That's going to keep that all in place. Now the sun's back out, I'm doubly worried about the uh, effects of the sun on the dry roots. So let's get the sprayer out again. Okay, what we could actually do is begin to fill it up with some soil in here. Okay, so I've got my pre-made soil. Okay, so this is some pre-mixed soil, uh, Akadama, pumice, lava, uh, all in this sort of showing size. And then there's a handful of uh, pine bark in there and a, and a little bit of uh, some sphagnum moss. Okay, so why do we put a little bit of sphagnum moss in, a little bit of pine bark, not a lot, just a tiny little bit, a bit of, a bit of it in there. Uh, what I've found is that particularly with beech, uh, that mycorrhiza, as we were saying earlier, absolutely essential. And so it needs something like 
something organic to really thrive on. And so just a tiny little handful of that has made, made a huge difference to my, uh, my beach cultivation. Okay, so just make sure we've got some soil underneath the roots, and then soil on top of it. Okay, we can work it in there. So getting all the dust out is, is important, even though we did put, you know, some sphagnum and uh, pine bark in there. We still want. We still want to get all that dust out so it doesn't plug up too much. Okay, because still worrying about that. Okay, we're not going to go too crazy on it. We just want to check that angle before we finish it off. Okay. Still quite a big gap underneath there, that hollow in there. So we've still got to put a lot of soil in there from both sides. Try and get that filled up. Okay. So the roots are nice and tight up against the uh, the rock because of the, the cable tie there. Okay. Now they're flowing nicely down into the uh, into the soil here, slightly uh, mounded up towards it. We've got plenty of soil in and around there. Now because of all the soil in there, the rock is very very solid. Okay. Now we just got to decide what we want to do in this hollow area here. Okay, sort of see in there. Okay. Uh, do we leave that open and exposed, or do we fill it with soil? Would be a kind of weird, interesting um, exposed root uh, aspect to the tree. Um, so I think what we'll do is we'll fill a backfill a little bit of soil in there, but we won't take it all the way up to the top, uh, and then just try and keep some of that exposed root feel in there. All right, so here we have basically the same stuff, same mix, but just smaller particles because we're trying to get into the smaller spaces and we want a bit more water retention up in there. So one thing I've just got to look for is that the, the keto areas here don't start to rise off of the um, off of the rock and we're not squishing too much soil then in there and you know, we want to get in as much as we can in there what might be interesting would be to plant another uh, have something else growing from in between there, maybe in between some of the, the um, some of the roots of that tree. Uh, a little fern, perhaps. So we're going to try and plant one just maybe there on that side. Okay, so here's a little fern uh, I prepared earlier. Just going to put that in. Down into the keto, put a little bit more keto on top of that. And if that thrives and does well, then maybe we could add another one, a couple more, maybe some other plants. 
we don't want it to become too much of a, a jungle, um, but just you know, another point of interest would be good. Uh, I'm cultivating some other ferns and such like. Uh, so perhaps later on in the year I might come around and, and change it for something different. Um, but we're kind of getting close to where we need to be. Okay, so next what we're going to do uh, some rough sphagnum moss. Okay, uncut uh, and just place that all over the uh, the outer edge of the the keto. Okay, we want to be pushing it into the keto so that. Uh, it becomes kind of like part of it. This is just on there to uh, act as a protective barrier so it doesn't wash away, uh, it doesn't dry out too much for that initial period until the roots uh, grow into it uh, and become uh, kind of solidify it. And so we're just lightly applying it there. Uh, and then if we feel like it needs to, if it's going to wash off, like it might do on this slightly more sheer face. Uh, then what we can do is um, just put some, some wire pins in to stop it from uh, um, from washing away. And what I'll do once everything kind of settles down and things are starting to grow, I'll, I'll, I'll come along and remove a lot of this sphagnum uh, just so that it doesn't, uh, you know, weeds don't grow into it, the roots don't grow into it too much. Um, and it becomes a problem for us. Because what we want to have happen is for a covering of more kind of attractive green moss to, to develop. Okay, so those areas where we were looking at the, the roots being trained down into the soil, this is where we're going to add quite a bit of sphagnum moss in there and cat, extra keto as well, just so we create that bridge between the rock and the soil underneath. Okay, it's always a, like a danger point of drying out uh, where those roots are there. It's always a danger point of drying out where those roots are going to be kind of exposed a little. Okay, and then finally the the root that we're trying to train across. Okay, this needs to be nicely covered. What we're going to do with this one is actually squish it into the keto a little bit more. Okay. Actually, kind of. And here we wouldn't be too concerned if the roots actually grew into the, the sphagnum. Uh, they are going to grow downwards, naturally going to grow downwards anyway, so as long as they follow the, the keto down towards the soil, then that's fine. And as soon as it reaches, the soil area in there. Okay, it starts taking moisture up from that area, then we can take that sphagnum away. Not be a problem. Okay, but this is something you just have to keep an eye on with watering, making sure it doesn't pop out, come off, dry out, that sort of stuff. Okay. All right, well that was a long one. Uh, you'd be glad to know there's only one smaller one left about cutting the top of the tree. Um, but important points to kind of like note from that is that uh, it was just that fortuitous um, accident really or situation where there was the crevice in the rock which kind of almost was in the perfect position for that root to, to, to kind of grow into. Uh, and you can't plan for that. And so having that kind of, um, like I sort of say, it's saying right at the start of the stream, the, the, the kind of the mental flexibility and this kind of like, let's just see where it takes this type of, uh, of attitude as you're going along, uh, really sort of helps with situations like that. Now, uh, somebody mentioned Daniel, uh, I believe it was, um, mentioned about uh, could the rock uh, be burst by that route? Absolutely, it could be. 100%, particularly this type of rock where, um, you know, just a, just a slight kind of like knock with a with a hammer can, can, can knock a piece off. Uh, it really is quite light, which makes it kind of usable, very usable for, for bonsai in one aspect, um, but potentially not long term. It could be, uh, it could be quite difficult, um, but I, that doesn't bother me. The, the, 
having the again this having this fixed concept like it's going to stay like that forever is just it's just not right it's going to evolve it's going to constantly evolve um and at some point the tree is going to get too big for the rock and it'll need to be either taken off air laid or something like that and there are a lot of trees um uh, rock plantings you know in japan and um that have been imported into europe uh maybe even some in america uh that you know where the the the, the tree has outgrown the rock because let you into a secret here rocks don't grow um but trees do and so you know once the tree has kind of like outgrown the rock then what can you do uh one of the first ever uh kind of um, articles that i did for bonsai europe as it was back then was to to air layer a maple off the top of um off the, that was that was in that sort of situation and um, we made this lovely little kind of like chewing tree out of it um uh, you know this, it's, it's going to happen at, at, at some point so the evolution of a, of a rock planting um over time is 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 absolutely kind of like part part of the course for bonsai so if it does break it, it could break it in such a way that makes it really interesting or it could ruin it who knows just have to wait and see uh, i'll do a live stream about it <laughs> in 50 20 years time um right so uh other points about kind of like the the soil mixture used there um i do tend to use that kind of uh akadama uh, lava uh a pumice mix for for, for for a lot of the deciduous trees as well uh i find that it holds on to to, to, to enough water uh and uh, somebody mentioned about trying to find the right sort of soil mixture for a wet climate i mean one of the reasons why i like that kind of soil mixture is it does give us a lot of control and the ability to kind of like not hold on to too much water uh, is, is kind of like essential for, for, for growing trees in the UK uh, for certain. Uh, what it does mean though is that, you know, in the middle of the summer I would have to um, uh, water three times a day. Uh, and so sometimes you do have to kind of like, uh, swings and roundabouts, just, you know, where you gain it on one aspect you're going to lose on another. Uh, and so it's just about finding the kind of the, the right sort of soil mixture that works for you. Uh, and I found it, it, one of the things that's, that's, that's more important really is, is the particle size. And you'll notice that, that was quite a small particle size. It was like a show him particle size. So there is quite a lot of water holding capacity in that soil. Um, realistically, most of the water kind of, re it, it does kind of get held like in the pockets between between the, 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 the soil particles as much as being absorbed into the soil. Um, a lot of people think of uh, grit, like granite grit, as being for drainage and things like that. Uh, the the growers down in Shikoku Island in uh, in Japan they use that almost entirely for for all of their trees. You know the, the, where they feel growing all the, the the pines and stuff like that because it holds on to so much water and so they have to water less because it sticks to those particles. Okay, and so. The more tiny little pockets you've got, the more ability you have to hold on to some water and stuff like that. So it is actually a fairly water retentive mix. Um, uh, but it also does help with kind of the aeration because of the pumice and the lava in there. Okay, so I've found that to, to, to work quite well. Uh, how do you control the roots of the fern not to take up space? Uh, is it difficult, different with ferns? Uh, you, just, you just keep cutting it out. Um, uh, you could go in and, and just, just, just cut the roots out and stuff like that. Uh, take off foliage to stop it from growing as well. Um, you know, so to cut some of those leaves off. Um, see you later, DC Lion. Uh, and uh, we've, still, we've still got a bit left to go, but um, not too long. Uh, but yeah, so you can just control it from through, through how much foliage is on there uh, and, and just take it out. And the thing about beach is they are gonna, they're always going to overpower anything else. The beach is so strong. And so you wouldn't have to necessarily worry about it with with a beach planting, uh, but with a, with other trees, uh, it might end up being a bit of a, a, an issue. Uh, and in that sort of situation, it's not really going to be affecting kind of like the drainage uh, because of, of the positioning of it and with it being like on the rock and things like that. So it's not too much of a problem. One thing that accent plants and stuff can do uh, with with rock plantings is very similar to the to, to the point it was kind of making about how a lot of Yamadori collectors, when they collect a tree, they will always leave the weeds in around the root base in order to, when they collect everything up, it holds all of that soil together because all the weed roots are, are in and around. So when they when they lift the tree up, you don't have this situation where all of the soil just falls off along with all the roots. Uh, and so 
if you've got something you know like an accent plant planted in it on a something which is a little bit more kind of like vertical where the keto is likely to fall off the the accent plant could send its roots out into the keto a lot quicker and actually bind it all together and hold it in place uh, and so there are there situations where you where it could actually be really really beneficial to you okay but now the the tree is kind of like fixed on uh, on the rock there um, pretty much uh, and so we can't really alter the the, the rock the, the tree and the rocks uh, orientation that's now become sort of fixed uh, and so the, the 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 design of the tree um, and kind of like the front and everything and now are starting to become a lot more focused and uh, uh, and defined uh, so now we're going to look at just how the, the the rest of the tree gets started it's not too long um, and then you're going to go off to bed okay so now it's time to uh, it's a couple of days later uh, I had some stuff to do uh, and, and now it's time to start looking at the branching structure uh, and what we're going to do with this uh, the top section here so Let's investigate that. Okay, we've got a couple of options uh, that I have in mind. Uh, and it's all based around what's going on with this dead wood and the live veins in here. So you can see this line in here. So you can see this line, this V here, everything above that is dead, okay, and the live vein for this branch sort of comes down here, around the back, and then the live vein for these, for the front section, Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to come in and cut underneath that branch there, maintain all the live vein on the back, okay, and cut all of that dead wood section out, okay, and then just have a look what it's, uh, have, have see what it looks like with, the, with keeping both of those branches there, okay. I'm thinking that it might not work, but I just want to give it a go, uh, and then alternatively what we would then do is we would then come in and cut all the way across there to that branch okay but let's just see what how that looks because it could end up with some quite interesting kind of feature up there okay i don't want to have a big thick gin sticking out the top of the tree because it will um detract from the from the taper okay what we want is for the eye to come up the trunk see this little movement in here and then come along this line okay so any gin in this area here the eye is just going to keep going up that strong main line okay so we're going to want to come up a little squiggle here and then along into here this branch could then be dropped down okay but for the time being all we're interested in is just dealing with this section here Now with the top section removed, we see the line of the trunk move up, got that little tweak in here, and then we follow the line all the way out to here. Now at the moment, what we're going to do is we're going to keep this section up in here, uh, I'll put a close up on, uh, just for the time being, uh, but there is one option just to continue that line out here, build all the branches off of that, but for the time being we'll just keep that for now. Okay, because if we turn the tree around, it looks just as good from the other side. Uh, and that branch here uh, has much more of an important part to play. Okay, so potentially from, some, from this angle here, we get just as equally as interesting a 
trunk uh, base movement and the trunk line we have almost identically coming up into that branch there and so at the moment there's, there's definite possibility of using both sides um, as potential kind of like fronts for the design uh, and so what we're definitely going to be doing over the future is looking at developing this as a non-fronted tree so you know, not being too specifically uh, obsessed with you know which side is the front but just being able to view it from lots of different angles because there are very different the, the, with this tree there are, there are multiple viewpoints where it looks really really quite attractive okay the one thing that we do have to consider is this branch growing up here and also the one that's just above it okay at first i thought that this one was going to be removed because of its uh, vertical kind of like nature but now you can see it's actually just coming just coming off at a slight angle whereas this one there so it's very sort of straight um, and vertical from this side whereas from looking at it from here it has a little bit more of a, a back branch sort of type feel to it and doesn't feel quite so um, ugly out of place okay so what i think we'll do is we'll just put a little bit of wire onto that one to push it out in this direction and have a look see how we feel uh, for the rest of the tree we'll have a look at removing some of these smaller buds uh, and whether or not we need all of these little branches in here as well so what i'm going to do is i'm actually going to try and bend the the, the branch into the position roughly where I want it as I'm applying the wire and hold it there. Okay. The application of the wire is very light. Try to get not too worried if there's slight gaps in between. The wire and the branch. It's a very deciduous technique rather than how we'd be wiring conifers. Okay, so that branch is roughly in the position where we want it to and I've yet to actually kind of go in and bend the wire itself. Okay. okay, so from this side now, with it just being positioned outside there, taking off that vertical um, sort of orientation feels a lot more kind of um, natural looking. However, it is going against the flow of the trunk across here. Uh, and so what I feel we'll do is we'll keep it for the time being um, and just look at how it feels with all the leaves on. Okay, because the um, the feel of the tree once it's in leaf will change completely, uh, and kind of like visual balances will change completely. Uh, but my my definite feeling from this side is to remove that. Okay, how can we do that there? Oh, look at that, beautiful. Would be to remove that. Okay, but from the other side, I like it. Okay, that adds depth and perspective, which is something that you can't uh, get too much from um, on this, uh, you know, looking at it on a, on a screen. Okay, so for the time being, we're going to keep it. I'm leading, I'm very much leaning towards this as the primary front. Okay, but I do like being able to view it from the other side as well. Okay, and what we'll do is we'll just tidy up some of these bits in here. So I don't mind having one or two youthful little shoots growing from here. I like that kind of like combination between um, aged branches and the youthful shoots that grow in. Okay. But like here, for example, we have two branches which are essentially doing the same thing. This one is coming from the same point on the trunk as this one. 
and so I'd like to get rid of this one and just maybe we'll look at developing that one for, for a year or two to see how it to see how it looks, see how it grows. Okay, we'll just get rid of that little stub on the trunk there. But for the time being, what I want to do is just to live with this tree for a year. Just see how it grows, see how it looks in leaf, see how it looks in its uh, autumnal foliage. Uh, and I can always make those decisions later on. Making big, bold decisions um, so quickly works with some trees um, and doesn't work with others. Okay, so I think we're going to call it a day here. Okay, um, the leaves are beginning to open out. The leaves are beginning to open out now. Okay, so what we're going to do is put this in the polytunnel, keep it there, allow it to leaf out in the polytunnel, keep it there for a couple of weeks. Once it's really growing and it's it's, it's not showing any sort of signs of of, um, of damage, then we will bring it outside on a nice, cool, calm day. You know not too much intense sunlight coming uh, and then it will get acclimatized to being outside okay but you can you can see what we've done to to really work with the line of that trunk okay it looks very straight there but there's ever so slight tiny bits of movement in there which are very subtle and then the reduction of that lump at the top transformed the tree and allowed the eye to come along this branch. Okay, uh, right, so that's it for, for videos and stuff. Um, so uh, I hope you can kind of get an idea of um, <laughs> what was going through my head uh, and the kind of like the, the, the creative uh, process um, and how just kind of like being a little bit sort of flexible and not being um, too kind of like fixed with what, I mean, I had that some roughly in my mind what I was, was sort of trying to go for, but I knew there would be certain kind of like gray areas um, particularly with the roots once we've had that sort of um, figured out it made it a lot more kind of like obvious uh, but where we were sort of going uh, as for making it kind of like the, the two front tree that is um, that is uh, it's something that I kind of like like to do um, this here uh, behind me uh, is a very similar type of creation that I did uh, last year there's pictures on Instagram Facebook whatever uh, and this is a, a two-fronted tree um, and so pretty much the same sort of techniques the same kind of like crappy material let's face it I mean like it's the type of material that nobody really wanted um, but just by sort of thinking about how you could kind of like utilize um, sort of different planting angles different positions there's a there's a beautiful kind of bit of um, movement up in here I should have got pictures prepared but you know um, I only thought about this just the last minute uh, you can kind of like play around with with relatively inexpensive material uh, the only kind of limitation is, is your own kind of um, uh, just the ima imagination and also kind of the, the limitation of you know sort of trying to do things too orthodox or, or trying to fit square pegs into round holes these both of these trees um, the other one here uh, they, they're, they're just kind of like they don't fit into any other category um, th th there's nothing really like that obvious and so if you take an obvious approach to it then you're not going to get anywhere with it and so just ne you need to have that kind of um, flexibility of, of mind um, and in terms of like the future development of the tree I did sort of say, say that um, uh, in terms of some of the other branches it's just kind of going to live with it for, for, for a while and just see how it goes one of the big 
kind of benefits of just being a little bit more flexible um, and sort of taking your time is getting to know the trick and over over a period of time. And one, I had another light bulb moment. Um, this time it was a couple of years ago at Salier, a big exhibition in France. I was translating for uh, uh, Japanese uh, demonstrators um, of uh, the disciples of Mr. Kimura. Uh, um, yes, I have Nick Dean's jumper. Uh, and um, Taigo Urushibata, who is uh, basically the same age as me, he's phenomenally talented um, and he's a really very interesting guy, he's an incredibly talented bonsai artist. And he was given a piece of Scott's uh, pine material to work. Like he saw it that morning, he's like, okay, go and do your demo. And it was a relatively difficult tree to, to kind of find. Um, like a, a an immediate image and, and he he kind of like he told me um, i was doing the translation he's like come to me last I, I need some time to sort of think about it and he was going through it um and people were asking, you know, asking him some questions he kind of he, he almost kind of like snapped and he was just kind of like how am i supposed to make decisions on this tree like life-altering decisions on this tree when i only met it this morning it's like the best way to, to to approach trees like this is to have them on your nursery for six months a year and look at them from time to time, different angles, different positions, different moods, like when you feel differently, um, different times of the year, see how the tree grows, see how the tree wants to grow, and then kind of start basing your, your decisions around that. And when he sort of said that and I was translating for him, I was just like, damn, that is, that is exactly what it is. Um, and that was a light bulb moment for me. And so, you know, when I do have sort of issue, issues like that, it's just like, okay, well, uh, we can always cut it off later. And there's a difference here between being indecisive. Okay, some people will be like massively indecisive. Like, I know what the, issue, the potential issues are, but equally, we should just sort of see how it goes. If that, bro you know, if that branch that we just wired uh, is still gonna be on the tree for like in five years time and it's, it's just not going anywhere, then we're gonna end up causing ourselves more problems um, there, than, than, than we're solving. But for, for for certain trees like that, you know, like those, it's it's good just to kind of like just just to sort of see how things go. But again, it's not being indecisive, okay. Uh, and for other trees, this approach definitely doesn't work, okay. There is a there is a plan, okay. There is a a, a general plan, and we've got this like plus or minus five percent on either side of it. Uh, is basically kind of like. Uh, the way to sort of uh, to, to, to look at it okay um right i think that's probably about it it's it's getting late uh it's it's quarter to uh quarter to 10 to 11. Yeah. uh so thank you very much uh everybody for, for for sitting through that i hope it was of some use uh apologies it was kind of like quite heavily uh video based um i hope or oh, thank you ian um <laughs> Uh, and I hope, yeah, I hope it was of, 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 of great use. Um, and it, it, I mean, it, it does show what you can do with, with quite cheap material um, if you just kind of like have a play around with it. Uh, the one point actually I, I forgot to make was pretty much that that plan. I know I said about being kind of like organic, but pretty much like where roughly where it was going, I kind of had an idea when I first bought it. Um, generally, when you when you when you approach a tree. And you see it for the first time. I know this might sound like I'm contradicting myself, but you you come up with a plan, and you you come up with an idea, and you see it, and then you look at any uh, potential problems and things like that, like looking at the, the the dead patch up in the top of the tree. It's like okay, if that had been something completely different, then maybe the tree wouldn't have worked at all. But you know, I saw that, thought okay, this is how I can work around it, and things like that. And making those decisions quite quickly uh, when you purchase the material is very essential for being a, uh, a professional. Uh, but generally, that kind of like um, the, the the first idea that you get when you come to a tree will generally be where you where you go along. Okay, which is you just have to have that ability to to, to maybe just like take slight uh, de deviations and things like that. Right. Okay, right, we, 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 we're calling it a night now. Um, so uh, the next stream is going to be on Sunday night. Um, and it is going to be uh, about kind of um, energy management within trees 
uh, and energy control and such like, um, which is uh, a very important topic, and it basically is spans across all species, all ideal, you know, all styles, everything with bonsai. I will basically distill what bonsai is into one sentence. Right. Okay, and so uh, we'll be doing that on Sunday, probably 9 p.m. again. Uh, all the links and stuff will be up there uh, on social media and such like. Uh, as I said at the start of the stream, uh, this is all for free. Uh, if you do feel like it's been of great benefit for you and you would like to show some love, uh, there is um, uh, a donate page on my website. Hopefully there it is. Uh, for those people who have already donated, basically, like because we're doing this just on an ad hoc basis, um, uh, it's just kind of like uh, formed quite organically like a lot of the trees um, basically kind of consider it to be like a, you know a subscription type thing uh, you know like a monthly fee uh, would be we, we would you know it would be normally um, and so just you know like one donation a month is, 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 is plenty um, you know if you feel like you've, you've you've had some worth from it then you know, you know I, I leave it up to people's honesty and, and people's good Good nature. Uh, if you can't, because you know times are tough, um, you know some people have donated, uh, you know, like five pounds and apologised for it. It's like no, thank you very much. It's the thought that counts. Um, because times are tough for everybody, um, and this is just like a way of everybody sort of kind of like getting through it. And like the attitude here that we have is, as long as our kind of like costs have been covered, which they have, then you know we're we're happy to to kind of like. Um, to, to share some knowledge and make people kind of like make their time locked away at home a little bit better and improve their bonsai knowledge. We will be looking at doing things, continue it in the future once lockdown's finished, etc. Uh, but we'll just have to see how it all goes in the future. So, uh, thank you all for, for, for tuning in. Just like to say, uh, this stream has been brought to you in association with Guinness. Uh, and I, I'm going to enjoy this lovely pint now. Uh, so I hope you will have uh, a suitable uh, refreshment uh, and enjoy. So cheers, everybody, especially the uh, the Irish contingent. Cheers.